most advanced recruiting techniques. Land the most desirable talent. Launch your company towards massive success. This is the Higher Power Radio Show with Rick Gerard. How do you compete against a huge company like Amazon or even a re really well-funded startup for talent? If you're competing checkbook to checkbook, you will lose every time. The only way to do it, to tilt the odds in your favor, is to totally create a, and really understand the career wounds of the person you are trying to recruit and be able to connect the dots as to how your opportunity fulfills their desires. Now, this requires that you just listen, stop selling and start understanding what is important to the individual. And this will allow you to stand out from your competition and allow the person you need to hire to see the value above and beyond the paycheck. I'm Rick Gerard, and welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show. We help entrepreneurs and executives win the strongest hires by sharing insights from top performing rebel entrepreneurs, game changers, and industry leaders like our guest today, Mr. Michael Downing. He is the founding partner of the MDSV Venture Fund. Michael is a Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur and has co-founded six software companies over a 28-year career. Three of his companies were acquired and one had an IPO back in 2006. And for the last three years, Downing has focused on investing in promising early stage tech companies via his venture capital fund, MDSV. Michael has recruited and hired and managed hundreds of employees over the span of his career, which is what makes Michael the perfect expert for today's topic. Michael, welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show today. Hey, Rick. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. I'm excited to have you as always. Um, thank you for being here because I've been actually trying to get you on the show for a while, but we finally connected up uh, recently. So I know it. Well, I mean, you got to tell everybody we we worked historically at what, like two or three of my companies in the past. I think yes. we worked together and you helped us yes. find amazing people. So there's a history there. Yeah, most definitely. I, and I, thank you for the, I, I'm glad that I did find amazing people for you because that was, I feel like when we worked together the last time was back when you were at Tout. And yeah. I, I think that was the beginning of my journey, my transition into retain search. So um, right. there, I was still a kind of that transactional recruiter at that point. So I'm I'm right. glad to be past that, but I, I'm happy always when I when I did a good job for somebody. Absolutely. So um, today we're going to discuss why leading with the checkbook is a very bad idea, especially if you're a startup. And then we're going to talk how, about how to win talent by uh, by providing value other than the money. Sound like a plan? Yeah, it's a big topic. Yep, exactly. So you're seeing it uh, up. You're in the Silicon Valley, and you probably see it quite often. Um, I, I know startups are just getting huge, huge numbers when they get funded these days and they're paying really, really well, right? Yeah. So what is the challenge at this point for that, that company that doesn't really have the funding yeah. yet? Uh, right. They don't have that big payroll to, to be able to, uh, to support. Sure. What, what, what are they running into right now? Well, I mean, this is, this is the, enormous challenge. I mean, this is the, the, the biggest mountain to climb for, for entrepreneurs and people who are starting new companies and, and young companies and early stage companies. And, you know, things have changed quite a bit. If, if this was 15 years ago or, or 20 years ago, what we'd be talking about right now is, oh, how do you hire good people when, you know, Google and Facebook and Amazon are paying them, you know, 500, 600 K a year, you know, whatever it may be to, to start. And now the landscape has shifted a little bit where other startups are getting 20 million, 30 million, $50 million, you know, series A's where they've got so much money that they're just going out and the, and the, the you know, the MO on hiring is how do we just, you know, create an insanely rich package for people where they just never question whether they accept it or not. And so it's, it's changed a little bit over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years or so. But it's still the biggest challenge. And, and there's, you know, one thing I always say, and over the years, having invested in a lot of early stage companies, I've, I've actually advised even more early stage companies. Everybody struggles with this challenge. And funny enough, it all, in my mind, it all goes back to this one singular 
kind of core premise of when you're starting a business and when you're trying to do a startup and when you're trying to hire that first, you know, six people, eight people, those kind of core members of your team that are going to do things like lead sales or lead marketing or, uh, you know, lead HR, these kind of really core, core positions. And that is if the vision and the dream and the mission of the company is not big, bold, beautiful, kick-ass, and amazing. It just makes everything harder, right? And when everybody else has got more money than you do, and when everybody else, you know, has already hired some, you know, badass engineer from Amazon or some kick-ass marketing person from Google or whatever it may be, you know, it just makes it incredibly hard to bring on people and get them to believe in what you're doing if it's not a big, bold vision. And I mean, funny enough, this is also a core requirement to raise money for that startup. So raising money and getting that first seed round or series A round or whatever it may be becomes infinitely harder if you don't have that big, bold vision. So this is a conversation I have with you know companies quite a bit, which is if you're struggling enormously on hiring key people, you may want to do a little bit of inventory on just, you know, the the vision of that company and the story that you're telling and, and your ability to get people to really believe in that and sign on and be part of that adventure. So you're thinking is that the, a lot of them are thinking way too small. Well, I mean, just generally speaking, talking to early stage companies who are trying to raise their first five million, eight million, you know, and so on out there and they're they're you know struggling enormously with hiring and finding key people in a large percentage of those scenarios you know they are thinking very specifically they're they're kind of zeroing in on a core business model or, or a certain role in the market and they're not thinking big enough and oftentimes you know these days if you're trying to hire an amazing person it's got a great track record a uh, great background you know, they've been in senior roles, they're only going to drop everything and join up with somebody if it's a dent the universe kind of opportunity. If it's something so, so big, true. so unique, you know, that they're willing in terms of opportunity cost to go out there and join up and do that with you. So it's got to be kind of a, you know, a big kick-ass vision uh, and role in the market, which is well, not always easy to put together. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, you know, we've seen it history like even uber like look how quickly uber took off and scaled right because right. of that vision that hey like we're going to completely disrupt yeah. and change the whole industry well and just and just as a great example when uber first started um you know they they struggled in the beginning right yeah. because it was a you know it was a uber cab it was a cab calling service and yeah. guess what that was not that was not really a huge vision and then within you know the next 18 months, they adjusted the articulation of that vision to you know changing the fabric of transportation and logistics. Wow. So you went from like a little model to you know change the world model. And that certainly helped things. And they, you know, were very successful at raising money at that point. Yeah. And you know, like you mentioned earlier, too, people are getting paid crazy numbers. So they yeah. That there's got to be something more than just the money in order for you to get somebody to join up with you, right? If you're trying to totally. pull really, really good people, it's and I'm going to take it down a little bit deeper. I think the people have to align with the values of the company as well. That's a absolutely, big, yeah. That's a big thing. I'm I'm noticing more and more, especially with this great resignation that we're going through, that oh, yeah. people are willing to talk. Uh, but it's got to be something that gives them something that they're missing in their current role. You know, like maybe yeah. they want some growth or some more responsibility, or maybe they've got a manager who's a schmuck and they want to get away from, but, but you've got to be able to kind of heal that, that piece of, um, of, yeah. of their pain point. Right. Yeah. I think it's a really good point. I mean, when you're the little guy, and when you're going up against people that have tons of money or, or tons of cachet or position in the market or whatever it may be, you know, you got to think about what enables you to punch above your weight. Right. And as we said, big vision, big dreams, like a, a, an amazing picture out there can definitely help you get those great folks. But then there's other things that are important, too. And you were alluding to them just a second ago, which is, 
oftentimes in the past, and, and not that this is a big secret, but you know, oftentimes you can find people who may have been not at that really super senior position, but just under it. And you could tell that they're performers, they deliver, they've contributed awesome, but they've definitely been under the thumb of somebody else. And if you can kind of give them that empowered position within your organization and hey, here's your chance to, you know, run with the horses and go go make it work out there. Sometimes that, um, you know, elevating somebody is enough to really get them to, to believe and, and join on. I, I've seen those be the best hires ever because right. you're giving somebody that ability to come up underneath somebody's shadow. But what, yeah. what happens is a lot of times we as entrepreneurs zero in on the person that's already doing the job. So yeah. we want them to come duplicate what they're already doing uh, for us. Right. And there's really no incentive for them to do that. It's right. just like, you're, you're just chasing the wrong rabbit. Well, that's a really good point. Is if you, if you think you're going to just go out and get somebody and just make them do this exact same thing that you saw them do at this other company, I don't think a lot of people are going to be super motivated by nope. just, you know, I want you to replicate exactly what you did over here. You know, they, they want the, kind of open canvas. They want the ability to get creative and and make their own way, you know, and do it their own way. And giving people, you know, a little bit of rain and, and letting them run with it is just such an important, uh, such an important concept. Yeah. And I'm finding that's the best way to draw talent today. You know, being able to give yeah. somebody the, the ability to spread their wings. If you can do that, Absolutely. you're going to win them. Um, why are you feeling that, or why, what are you finding is this is being important to a company? Why is this important to a company today? Well, I mean, you know, things have changed a lot. Things have changed a lot, even in the last couple of years, right? How people are working, where people are working, uh, why people are working, like everything has uh, kind of been turned upside down and, and shifted. And so, these, these things that we're talking about, which are, you know, how do you identify or motivate or get people excited about joining on is one thing, but there's this, this other, you know, humongous topic that everybody is dealing with from the biggest companies like Google down to, you know, early stage seed stage startups, which is the way in which we work and connect and engage and collaborate is forever changed. And it's, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to go back anytime soon. No. And so one thing that I think is is really important is, you know, this this idea of, of, of not conforming to some old notion of how people are going to contribute and how people are going to get things done. And obviously, on a on a kind of national uh, landscape, we're seeing this, you know, crystal clear and this great resignation and, you know, people just saying, hey, if I got to come back into the office, I'm out of here. Right. And they can do that because there's yeah. 10 other positions for them to take. Right. Or join a startup or live off my crypto or, you know, whatever it may be. Right. Yeah. So um, so the way in which people contribute, the way in which they play an important team role like that, the definition of how that works has changed. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story and, you know, really showing my age here. and. Uh, but back in the nineties, when I first started doing startups in San Francisco, and this is like, you know, 95, 96, 97. And just so you know, at that point, startups were not cool. They weren't cool till about 98, you know, as people started moving out to the West coast and moving to San Francisco to do them and people would actually leave their jobs and join a startup. Yeah. Uh, in 96, it was only the, the crazies and, you know, people who kind of threw caution to the wind who would who would join you in one of these early stage startups. But one of the things that that I started doing in about 96, 97 and kept doing this throughout the, the late 90s was when we'd get a company going and we'd get a bit, a bit of uh, uh, seed financing, the moment I would go out and get us an office. Um, I would always do this one thing that, that people thought was hilarious and crazy. And I got kind of a reputation for it, which was I would always force the landlord to write into the office deal that people could bring their dogs into the office. And I remember the first time I told my you know, real estate broker, like, yeah, this has to be in the contract. He's like, that's insane. It'll never happen. This is a building owner. You know, you can't do it. And the reason why I pushed for that 
which I think is kind of in line with people's changing habits and how they're working and, and just the way the world is, has shifted, is I realized back then, at that time, I was dealing with a bunch of, you know, younger, highly technical people, a lot of single people who, you know, many of them did have a dog at home. And I knew yeah. they had to leave that dog at home and it kind of screwed up their lifestyle. And they had to run home at lunch to walk them and whatnot. And so I just said, we're just going to have this written in. So every couple of years when I had to shift to go and get a new office space for our companies, I mean, we got known as like, you know, the wacky CEO who makes the landlord write into the contract that dogs are allowed. And like, oh, I'm going to have to change my insurance and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. But it actually worked. And then, you know, after a couple of companies, I would hire people back or people from my first company would come join. And they would always say, yeah, I remember how this was the first company I could go to where like we could bring our dogs to work and I didn't have to run home. But at that point, that was kind of a nutty, nonconformist thing to try to make the lifestyle component of being part of the company interesting and better and more accommodating. And I, I think we're all challenged with that now in a different kind of way. If somebody wants to sit on a beach in Thailand and, and write code, you know, that's OK Let as long them. as they're contributing. <laughs> you know, I'd like because if they're not going to do it for you, they're going to do it for somebody else. <laughs> and now right. we're in a global workforce, so somebody might recruit yeah. them from you know Brazil or Thailand or wherever else, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think twenty percent of Google's programmers are sitting on a beach in Thailand right now, coding. <laughs> Just FYI. Good for uh, them. All right, you're listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and for our podcast listeners, we're going to take a quick educational moment from our sponsors. Hey, subscribers, keep an eye out for our newsletter. We're giving away 10 signed copies of Healing Career Wounds. Uh, simply com complete the link survey uh, and your name will be entered into a drawing. You'll also be able to download a free chapter of the book just for participating. Our guest today is Michael Downing. He's the founder par founding partner of MDSV Fund. And we're discussing why it's a bad way to, ch why it's a bad idea to lead with your checkbook today. And uh, in in how to compete at a deeper level. So we just talked a little bit about some of the challenges, Michael. Let's let's bust into what the solution is for this because um, yeah. I I think uh, we both have some pretty strong ideas on on how you can win talent without having to like write a huge check. Yeah. Well, you know, we 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 mentioned earlier, which is I'm just going to repeat it because it's such a key concept, which is at least for early stage companies, making sure, and this goes along with kind of the notion of your values and what the company's all about, and you know, what people are committing to and signing up for when they, when they join the company. But uh, we, we mentioned just that the vision of the company has got to be big and bold, right? You yep. got to be on a mission to do something big. It's not just some incremental improvement or some, you know, the, the eighth CRM technology to compete or, you know, whatever it may be. It's got to be something big and bold. People want to be a part of something special. Yep. And so that is really, you know, crucial. Um, we talked, you know, a little bit about, you know, not conforming to tradition and making sure that you create an environment where those values are reflected and where people's lifestyles and who they are and what they like to do is something that's, that's supported. Just in terms of tactically, one of the most important things that, that I communicate um, to early stage companies, well, actually young and, and mid stage companies alike, when it comes to finding great people, when it comes to recruiting people and actually going through that process successfully of getting people to join. One of the, the biggest recommendations I always make is, is what I call, you know, plant your roots deep, which is basically set up an advisory board, find great people out there who are experts, experienced, who have, who have you know, built great companies who have sold companies, taken them public, whatever, they've had some you know, level of success. They are a credible voice, recognized individual. Make them believers in what you're doing, which by the way is a good test. If you can't get them to be deliver, uh, believers in what you're doing, maybe you need to adjust your, your vision. But with those advisory board members, they become such an unbelievably helpful resource in identifying and recruiting and walking people through the process of joining the company. I mean, I cannot tell you just in my own companies um, how many times 
We found an amazing candidate. We knew it was the perfect person. We knew it was a competitive situation and we were the underdog. And because we had some great advisor who was a known person who said, hey, let's go grab coffee. And that impressed the heck out of the candidate that it helped us get the ball over the line and, and make it happen. And I've seen it happen over and over again with my portfolio companies too. It's just such a great resource. Yeah. You know what I see quite often? I, you know, I run into a lot of uh, pre-funded startups that I'm, you know, I, that are um, ir- around the area and it, they all complain about not being able to find a co-founder or somebody else to like join right. their team. And, and um, they have advisors that they've brought on, but they're not really utilizing those networks of their advisors to get the introductions uh, to get people on board. But yeah. I think that might have loop around too to the other problem that you had mentioned earlier was maybe the idea is not big enough, right? To get somebody yeah. attracted. Um, if you're doing right. something small, I don't see somebody quitting their job to uh, to go join on to to build a lifestyle company with you. Absolutely. I mean, like I said earlier, this this should be looked at as kind of a filter, right? Like, hey, if I can't get advisors excited about what I'm doing, how the heck am I going to get somebody to quit their job and join me and you know take on a senior role, right? And so, in a way, I kind of look at it as concentric circles. You know, when I'm when I'm creating a business or, or starting a business, like, can I get four to six well-respected known people in the market to listen to my pitch, listen to what I'm doing and get super excited about it. If I can make that happen, then next concentric circle, can I find some key people out there in the market whose skills and background and, and, you know, work history, I really respect. Can I talk to them and get them excited about potentially joining the company? Right. And so if you just kind of follow that flow, you know, uh, to use a kind of musician uh, analogy here, you know, you, you you develop a new album of songs, you're going to go to the local bar and sit there and play it for the, you know, 20 folks who are sitting in that bar. And if they really like it and respond well, well, then you may go on tour and, you know, hit the West Coast. And if they really like it, you may, you know, tour the rest of the country. So I think you have to kind of think about this um, counterintuitively in the same way where, this is a process of really developing an amazing vision, a, a mission for the company, and as you said, a set of values that kind of defines who the company is, and then evangelizing that and, and getting people excited about it so that you get the team members you need, you get the advisors you need, and then not to you know avoid the obvious here, you get the investors you need, right? Like it's impossible to get early stage investors on board, whether it's a 500k round or a five million dollar round unless they can really believe in a big vision and it doesn't sound like you know the same thing that these other four companies are doing or six well how do you know when you have a big vision what's the tip off for the entrepreneurs that your vision's too small or not big you know what i mean yeah i mean mean, you're you're probably not getting people writing checks well i mean that's the other thing is, is you have to pay attention to the, the data, you know, the feedback, like how are people responding? And it's one of these things where when you see it, you know, it's, you know, it's happening. And when it's not, it's not, there's not a lot of gray area. Right. And so, you know, I forgot who it was. I think it may have been Keith Raboy or somebody who said, you know, a great vision or a great kind of pitch that lays out the vision of a company. When you're in a room, there's guys sitting around the table and you give that pitch, you know, you want half the folks in there to say, that's crazy. And half the people to say, oh, that's cool. And if if that's kind of the, the you know, the composition of reactions, then you know, you're on track. And I, I, I agree with that because- <laughs> that's, that's fantastic advice, by the way. Because I think yeah, because, a lot of people yeah. don't read the room and they just kind of like leave and they have no, they think they did well in the pitch, but right. there's no feedback. And, and then, you know, weeks go by and they're kind of scrapping to find out what, what went on. I mean, I can tell you in just my own situations, meaning my own companies that I started over the years, the ones that really took on a lot of momentum and, and did incredibly well were the ones where at the earliest stages I was pitching people, when I would walk them through what we were doing, 75% of the people say, that's just impossible. You know, like that, that's, 
not going to happen. Like that, it's it's just too it's too out there. It's like too too crazy, right? But twenty five percent of the people will go like, oh man, that's that's amazing. Like if you can if you can do that, this is going to be incredibly cool. And so I I think you've got to shoot for that kind of moonshot position some big vision even if you're you're working on something as mundane as you know the next great crm software and i apologize to all the crm software developers out there it's just the most (laughs) mundane thing i can think of yeah but there's got to be some way that you can repackage it and envision it as you know it's going to do so much more or be something so different than what we're all accustomed to as a crm application so you know, this has to do with with vision and uh, being able to see a market that others can't see. And, um, you know, that's uh, that's part of the whole process. And it's just as important for candidates that you're trying to recruit and hire as it is for investors that you're trying to get to write a check into your company. That's so very true. All right. So how does one build like how do how do I really build a strong advisory board? Like what would the steps be that I'd need to take? Because, you know, like I, I agree with you 100 percent. And you know what? I've been actually doing it maybe a little bit backwards because I haven't really full out, fully built out my advisory board. But I've started laying the groundwork for the lot of people that I've known throughout the years that I'm right. I'm starting, you know, that I've cultivated relationships with to join my company once I get it going. Right. Right. But to build that advisory board, which is going to lead to introductions to people that'll ultimately ensure your success in getting funding or whatever else. How do I do that if I don't know where to go? Yeah, it's such a good question. And and the truth is there's really only one way to do this, which is do exactly what you just mentioned a second ago, which is let's take inventory of everybody I know, right? Let's look at everybody I know and I've worked with over the years. And let's look at their relative connections to, you know, key influencers credible voices in this market or an adjacent market or recognizable folks who um, have a position of, of authority, you know, in certain markets. And th- those are different kinds of people, right? There are, you know, successful entrepreneurs who have built companies in certain categories. That's a great kind of advisor. Why? Because they've done it. They've, they've you know, been successful. They've gone through this, this whole challenge and, and they can be really valuable. There's slightly more technical voices of authority and credibility, right? Like this may be, you know, this amazing developer who created, you know, Lucene back in the days, which, you know, led to index databases and whatnot. So it might be something that's that's kind of a highly technical uh, credibility and having those people, which which appeals to a different group. And I think it's really good to have a blend of advisors that have that kind of business builder, entrepreneurial background and cachet, maybe some highly technical and kind of industry, you know, uh, technology kind of cachet. Um, And then, you know, even others that may be just known for being investors in great companies, right? Uh, And being able to help those companies. Um, So, you know, we've got quite a few of those folks in Silicon Valley. And if you have that combination, you know, that can that can really i mean give you superpowers in terms of who you can connect with who you can recruit but but in order to get to those people i think you have to start with here's everybody i know here's everybody i've ever met and who can connect me to these folks it's pretty hard to just cold pitch a lot of these you know well-known individual folks who could be great uh, advisory board members and so you really got to work your network and you know, one person can connect you with three others, and those three others can connect you to more. So there's kind of an amplification and network effect here that can happen if you really work it. It's kind of like the three degrees of Kevin Bacon, right? So like you can find yeah. somebody who knows somebody who knows that person. Right? It all goes back to Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you know what? I would just like to add one thing too to this is that yeah. when you've built out like a strong advisory board, please, please, please have a strong interview process in place as well. So that if you yeah. have, if you get these introductions to people, they take you seriously. You know, well, as a startup, I that's think a, that's yeah. the challenge. That's a really good point. I think you and I were talking about this the other day, but I mean, it, when I think back on it, I mean, and by the way, I've, 
I mean, the first one to say, I have made every mistake in the book. I mean, over six companies, I've literally named a mistake and I've made it. <laughs> Luckily, I got lucky a few times along the way. But, um, you know, one thing that we used to do, and I, I just think back on it, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe we did this, is we would spend so much time trying to identify great candidates. We would spend so much energy trying to, you know, engage and attract them and, you know, get them excited about the company. And then when it came time to interview, we would just wing it. Like, I mean, I would, you know, I was 25, 26, 27 years old when I was doing some of these kind of, I'm sure some of these folks just thought we were complete idiots when we were doing <laughs> interviews. Cause we were just like, let's talk about, you know, what you did last week. And yeah. there was absolutely no structure to it whatsoever. Yeah. And, and you probably we, lost a good people, like a, oh my quite God. a few good people I'm, because of that. I, I, I'm sure some a oh. lot of those folks walked out of these interviews just like, who are these jokers? And so <laughs> um, had I, you know, if I were able to go back and kind of do it differently, I would have definitely listened to some of my, you know, more senior advisors or smart people or have more of a methodology. You know, you spend all this time to get people in the top of the funnel. Don't screw it up by having a kind of, you know, fly by the seat of your pants interview process, which is unstructured, which I did. And, and I would, I would agree with you hundred percent. And that's where most people lose talent is mid funnel yeah. or in the interview process. All right, shoot. We're yeah. um, getting pretty close on time. Michael, what would be two or three key takeaways you can give the audience so they can plug into their business today? Yeah. I mean, as you're out there trying to build out the team and do great things, I mean, I think that the three key points that I always come back to are Make sure that that core vision, the values, the the mission of what the company's trying to do is enormously big. In the early stage, it can't be too big. It can't be too big. Um, you know, I would say the second thing that's critically important is think about how you can build out an advisory board of respected and credible folks. That will be a superpower uh, for recruiting and hiring. And then, you know, I think the last thing, especially in light of what's been going on over the last couple of years, is don't be a conformist in terms of how you structure the relationship with great people. You know, get creative on how you support people's changing work habits, schedules, lifestyles, et cetera, and, and, and be open with that. And that just comes down to listening to your people, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Michael, thanks so much for your time investment today. And I want to welcome you to the Higher Power Radio community. Now, what would be the best way in which members of the audience can find you, find out more about uh, your, your fund? Yeah, you can just uh, email me at michael at mdsv.vc. Awesome. All right. I want to thank our listening audience for tuning into this week's episode of Higher Power. A quick thanks to our team, Brian Colburn, Andrea Ballin, and Ayla Gerard. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, review, and share. After all, this show is for you, and we welcome your feedback. You can join the Higher Power Radio community at higher, H-I-R-E, power, P-O-W-E-R, radio, R-A-D-I-O.com, or you can drop me an email at ricketstridesearch.com. Tune in next Tuesday. Our guest is going to be Nada Nasruddin. She is the founder of Rise Up For You. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you for listening to Higher Power Radio. Catch our LinkedIn Live Show every Tuesday at noon or download the podcast on iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. We appreciate you joining us on Higher Power Radio with your guide to recruitment success. Rick Gerard. Rick Gerard. Rick Gerard.